Well, actually, this is as real as it gets. This is Angel Leanne coming straight to you from the United Kingdom, and you are listening to the UCW radio show. In your face. <laughs> the number you have reached, 911, has been changed to a non published number. You're listening to UCW Radio. In your face. All right, welcome to the UCW Radio Show. We have another great guest on hold waiting to come on the show. And, I mean, this guy is a, is a comedy um, icon, I'm going to call it. Uh, he's been to the mountaintop. He's been all around town, and he's a staple in Hollywood. Uh, he created a force, a comedy force, uh, called Rock Stars of Comedy uh, with some very interesting people such as uh, Tommy Lee. So, uh, yeah, you know, his story is pretty amazing, and I'm really happy to have him uh, as a guest on the show because I think that, you, that, that our listeners are going to get inspired by what, he needs, what he's going to talk about because his journey... A lot of people don't know about the things uh, or, or the the hurdles that he had in Hollywood, okay, or in his personal life. So this is one of the first times he's going to actually let it loose. So uh, anyway, he's on hold. So without further ado, welcome our guest, Stevie D. <coughs> All right, Stevie, welcome to the UCW Radio Show. Thank you, brother. Thanks for having me, Lou. Ah, well, thanks for thanks for coming on. I know you have a full from TV, film, comedy. You got all types of things going on, so I appreciate you taking the time. Well, thanks for having me, buddy. You know we're rocking and rolling, but more than happy to take a minute out, you know, and uh, and wrap with you, man. All thanks right. for thanks for having me. All right, good deal, good deal, man. I, I want our listeners to get a really good picture of uh, who Stevie D is. Uh, you're you're involved in actually you're one of the creators of Rock Stars of Comedy, and that, that, correct. And that's a big thing that's going on now. L- let's touch on that, and then we'll move forward because your story is is uber interesting, and I think um, you know our, our listeners are going to be uh, taken back from the stuff we're going to talk about. Well, thank you, buddy. Yeah, Rock Stars of Comedy is something I created a few years back. It came out actually three years ago, but before that. I had a very successful show at the Laugh Factory here on, in Hollywood on the Sunset Strip. And uh, Thursday nights were my nights, and they got really big, where anybody from Chris Rock, Dane Cook was a regular every Thursday night. It was rock stars, you know, it was, it was madness in there. And it was like higher energy than any comedy show that was going on. You know, you, were, you wasn't going to go in there on Thursday night and see some, you know, somebody complaining about airline food or any, you know, anything like that. So I looked around, I saw Kings of Comedy, uh, you know, I saw these blue collar comedy tours, there was uh, the Latin Kings of Comedy, and I said, you know, who's, who's my people, who, who are the rockers and the, the troublemakers out there, you know? So I tried to set up a diverse lineup, just like I did in my show, where I had a Korean guy, I had a Jewish guy, I had me, I'm a hillbilly from Kentucky, but we all brought it, we all brought it like a rock star, you know, we all wanted to raise hell and everybody to leave there with their ears ringing like they'd just been, you know, kicked in the huevos. And, uh, you know, just have to make a party out of it. So I, I got some guys on, on board to, to back my, my deal, and, and, uh, and we did it, and, it, and it turned out great. You know, I had, some, had an excellent lineup. Um, it came out looking like a rock concert. DVD did very well. And since, since then, we've uh, now signed Tommy Lee to host, and we're shopping it as a, as a television show. Yeah. So hopefully, you know, you'll see it soon. Yeah, you, and you, you're hanging out with Tommy Lee. Ooh, that's corruption on a high level. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to be a good guy, but, you know, he's got a reputation. And uh, it's funny, the first meeting we had was with the president of, of, of HBO. Right. And uh, he had a brand-new boardroom. They were going to christen it just for us. They opened the doors. No meeting had ever taken place in there. And we go in, there's about eight or ten people on my side of my team, a brand-new big mahogany executive desk right in the middle, not, not a scratch on it. The president comes in, the president of HBO is on the other side. It's too far to reach, so Tommy decides to dive across the table and scratches the table the damn t- all the way across with his, with his belt buckle. <laughs> and I said, there, there you go, that's rock and roll, baby. <laughs> <laughs> so 
But they didn't, they, they didn't pick up the show, so, uh, you know, I don't know if that was a good idea on Tommy's behalf. Yeah, and well, he left his mark, right? <laughs> That's right. It's a good, good story for them to tell. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, Tommy Lee uh, lunged at me. He's lucky he didn't get a lawsuit. <laughs> <laughs> Security. Yeah, exactly. He can go, he, he can go uh, join up uh, Pamela. But anyway, um, <laughs> all right, so now, I mean, your, your, your journey – to date hasn't been you know all uh you know uh it hasn't been easy it ha- hasn't been like your your cookie cutter journey man you've been going through some stuff in your life that has actually changed your life from family to health and things like that you know um you know w- w- let's talk about what's going on with your health you mean that little bump in the road that little cancer thing that little yeah. that little speed bump yeah that, that, that little speed bump in <laughs> that your life thing. yeah <laughs> yeah you know like yourself i you know worked out and i try to take care of myself and ate organically and all that good stuff for, for over 20 years and uh then my son came along and but at the time i was still wild and you know i could you know party all night and you know get up at five o'clock in the morning and still do my thing but i you know after my son was born i decided to to step back a little bit, take care of myself, got health insurance, tried to be a grown up, and um, my wife made me go get a checkup. I said, Oh, I'm sure I'm fine or whatever. And, uh, but I would be in the gym and I would see these commercials, you know, and it was target, you know, like it would be on CNN and it'd be targeted towards old people. I thought and show like these, you know, gray haired men saying, Do you get up and go to the bathroom a lot at night? And, you know, you haven't, you know, problems urinating. I was like, Yeah, as a matter of fact. <laughs> but, uh, so I was in there. I was like, well, maybe I had too many vodka cranberries at the sky bar the other night and, you know, messed things up or something. But, but I went in, I said, just asked the doctor, I said, hey, can you just kind of check this out? And I said, you know, I think I may have a, you know, an enlarged prostate. And so, you know, he did the, the Shawshank thing. He violated me a little bit and didn't buy me dinner. <laughs> but uh, they didn't do the full test. They didn't do the, uh, the blood stuff. Right. And this was actually, you know, s- several years ago years ago and he said well with your age you know we're going to rule that out and you know you're probably just drinking too much water you know and so i said all right didn't worry about it too much and then a couple years later i went you know was still having the same deal and felt like something funky was going on Mm -hmm. so i went at a different insurance company so i went in for another checkup and this insurance company does a more thorough examination and does the blood work and all that fun stuff and uh and they came back and said, hey, we need you to come in for this biopsy and blah, blah, blah. As it turns out, yeah, I had, I had cancer. Oh, wow. And I had prostate cancer, which is like an old man's cancer, the average age of 72. So that was pretty crazy. Um, and they said, yeah, and you had it the first time around when you thought something was going on. So uh, I called my old insurance company, and they didn't call me back. And so I said, you know, you know, there could be a potential lawsuit or whatever. But mm-hmm. the procedure they do, you know, shop is closed, no more kids. And since then, I've had a daughter. So if they would have done this procedure two years ago, the silver lining is I wouldn't have my daughter now. Right. So it's all good. So it's all right. It all worked out. But the, the, I guess the moral of that story is always get a second opinion. Get checked. Yeah, get checked, guys. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the plumbing's all good now. You know, rocking and rolling again. So, you know, that was scary. But, you know, we're healthy again. And, uh, and I didn't tell, as I was telling you the other day, Lou, I didn't, I didn't tell a lot of people in the business, you know, just kind of kind of a proud guy and, you know, just didn't want it to be out there too much. And I was having meetings. I was going to meetings with Tommy and selling these shows. And, you know, I just didn't want to, you know, to me, I didn't want to be looked at like there's a chink in your armor or what's going, this guy's a rock star, but you know what? He's got issues with his junk, you know? So I just kept it low key. And then uh, when everything was good and I just had my year checkup on St. Patty's Day. And I was, uh, as I was telling you, I wrote a book about it. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, so hopefully something good came out of it. And, uh, my advice would be, you know, guys get checked. Yeah, well, and I mean, you, again, as I said earlier, you went, you've been through a lot, and that that's a biggie. That's a biggie, you know. And and I guess in Hollywood, you can't show that weakness because there is a possibility that people may look at it as a, a weakness on your part, as as opposed. Yeah, well, is this guy going to be around? And you yeah. know, what if we sign a deal with this guy and he's not even going to be able to deliver the show because right. he's, you know. And, uh, so everything's going to be in the book. Um, and I chronicle the whole journey of the whole deal. And at the same time, you know, tell a lot of, you know, stories about my shenanigans growing up and in Hollywood and in comedy and all that good stuff. Yeah. You, you were kind of a bad boy, Stevie. 
<laughs> you know, <laughs> don't tell my kids that. <laughs> no, no, they, no, they're not going to be listening to this show ever. <laughs> <laughs> they haven't seen rock stars of comedy yet. They, they, they think I'm good daddy. Yeah, well, you know, you I mean you, you, you're a good daddy because what you do with your kids has nothing to do with what you're doing uh, elsewhere. So you are a good daddy. I know that. You know. Well, thank you, bro. And uh, I know uh, your. I mean, your kids mean the world to you. That's right, man. And, and that's, that, what, that's what it's all about, you know. Yeah, well, that's what that's what keeps you fighting, and that's what keeps you doing what you're doing because rock stars of comedy. You know, that's something that is is a huge project for you. You know, and again, you, as you said, you got Tommy Lee there, and I think uh, you have uh, you know Rich Franklin as well, right? He's, he's part of that deal or something. No, I got a separate deal with Rich Franklin. Um, um, it's kind of like a scared straight, and uh, Rich is fighting this this Saturday, I actually think, and uh, hopefully he wins, so uh, that can pimp him out even more. You know, mm-hmm. it'll raise our stock in our project. Yeah. Well, so uh, yeah, if there's any way we can rig that fight, that would be great. We'll talk about that off the air. Yeah, but, uh, <laughs> pimping ain't easy, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> now, Rich is a Rich is a good guy. I got a project I created with him. We're, we're shopping around and and. It's, Actually, one day we're we're out doing pitch meetings, and I'm in traffic, and Rich is driving, and I'm just like, please let somebody cut us off. Please let's have some road rage, <laughs> so I can see Rich choke somebody out, and we can upload this video on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> you get some viral <laughs> viral stuff going yeah. on. <laughs> All right, Rich, did you hear that guy just called you over there in the Toyota? <laughs> yeah, yeah, but you know what? Rich has learned through the martial arts to find that peaceful self. And I, I, think, I know. Unfortunately, I couldn't get him riled up, you know. No, well, that's training, man. That's training. And just, just for our listeners that don't know who Rich Franklin is, you know, he uh, is a UFC fighter. and uh, Three-time UFC champion. Three-time yeah, champion. former high school teacher. And, and one of the nicest guys out there. Exactly. Okay, and I'm, I'm saying yeah, that see, I'm saying that because I don't want any problems. <laughs> and the same, same here, you know. Yeah. <laughs> nothing, nothing but compliments for Rich. Um, and if I don't sell the show for him, I'm gonna have to change my name. Yeah, well, you know what? I think I think everything's gonna work well with that. Everything you have going on now. Your your book. When is that set to be released? We just finished the first draft. I'm sending it out right as we speak. Uh, of course, I got a. You know, I'm from Kentucky, so I've got a lot of editing to do as far as the gr- grammatical mistakes and all that stuff that I'm not worried about. You know, the meat and potatoes, the stories are there. Uh, so the first draft just got finished. And I uh, might have to add an extra chapter, you know, about you in it after this phone call. So, uh, you know, I'll let you know. I'll keep you posted on uh, on the updates on that, and hopefully you'll see it soon. Yeah, well, I look forward to seeing that book and having that thing come out. I have a, I have a feeling uh, that once it gets out there, you know, you may be looking at a bestseller. And I'm just saying because this is what I see. <laughs> Well, thank you, buddy. I appreciate it. You got it, man. Now, good, good vibration. Yeah, always good vibes, man. Always good vibes. You know how we roll. And uh, <laughs> now you have, uh, yeah, I mean, th- these are a couple of projects you have going on, but you have one uh, big reality show project that's kind of like your, your, I guess, your focus on right now because this is the one that's uh, you're casting for right now. Yeah, we're casting one right now called The Lead, and. Uh, it's going to be like The Apprentice, but for news anchors and entertainment reporters. Mm-hmm. So if you notice on TV, you get you know girls that are 22 with a big rack giving you the Dow Jones report. Right. And I was like, are, are these girls really qualified to you know for for this job? And uh, so I teamed up with a girl named Michelle Alexandria, and she's out. She was an anchor person out of Chicago, mm-hmm. and she's in LA out here now. So I teamed up. We created a show called The Lead, and they're all competing. It's uh, it's going to be a weekly elimination show, and each week someone gets voted off. So like if the mayor is having a press conference because he slept with a prostitute or something, you know, we'll send them out on a challenge. The panel of judges will send them out and they'll have to come back to get a sound bite. You know, why did the mayor do this? You know, it wasn't him, blah, blah, blah. And the person that doesn't come back with, you know, to meet the challenge that week will be eliminated. And you'll have separate challenges so, per contestant. Yeah, you know, per each week there'll be different challenges. There could be teams like on The Apprentice where they're all working towards the same challenge for that week. Mm-hmm. And uh, newscasters like Michelle, our host, when she's coming up, she was in the trenches. You know, just like when you're coming up in wrestling or mm-hmm. I was coming up in comedy, you know, we start out in the dives and work our way up. Sure. Uh, a lot of newscasters in the bigger markets like New York and L.A. and Chicago are going, you know, going straight from broadcasting school to a big market. Whereas instead of paying their dues, instead of going out, you know, in the slums when there was a, a gang shooting or, you know, and then writing their own copy and putting a camera up and editing themselves, 
we're going straight to the well, we're making them go back to the trenches. And if they can't take it, then they're you know they'll be sent back to you know Shreveport. <laughs> Shreveport. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you, you know something that's also a good learning experience because a lot of people, you know, and I, I love the concept of the show, and I, and I think this is going to be a hit, and this is my unbiased opinion because you look at reality shows, you have everything from the Biggest Loser to Bachelor, Bachelorette, uh, this that. Jersey Shore, and I think that they're going to probably come out with their biographies. Oh my God! And then you have uh, you know, all the stuff going on there uh, on, on television because you have they need so much content, but you have reality shows that really are so ridiculous. But this right exactly. here, but this right here, you actually you're on a reality show. You're not throwing pies in each other's faces, and you actually are, are have the possibility of getting a real gig at the end of the deal. Exactly. Yeah. You know, just like the Apprentice, I don't know how many of those people actually end up working for Donald, but with this, they will get a network gig as a as an anchor, as the lead on the network. You know, at the end of the at the end of the uh, the final episode, there. Yeah. Well, I, I know. If, you know? I, I know on on the Apprentice. I think it was uh, uh, Erin something or other. Uh, she came in second, but she's actually, I believe, she was on CNBC. You know, so oh, yeah, yeah, very yeah, cool. yeah, they they do they do move on because you have that opportunity, and all you need is that mm-hmm. stage, man. You're going to provide that stage where just just like you got American Idol, okay? They provide mm-hmm. the stage, win, lose, or draw. You just got out there. You're in front of people. Exactly. You're in front of millions. So you actually increased your chances of either, either. I mean, as a news person, either going to a bigger market or going doing something else or just getting in front of people that normally you wouldn't get in front of. Exactly. You know, a lot of people are delusional in this town, believe it or not, <laughs> just like in New York. And when they think they have skills, well, you know, step up to the plate, you know, just like in, just like in stand-up. A lot of people, you know, think they got the goods and they get in front of an audience and, uh, you know, fail to bring the laughs and it's kind of uh, the goal there, you know, and this is it's going to be a similar situation where, you know, you got to deliver or, you know, it's going to be out there. No, and, and you're casting for this right now, right? And the winner is going to be your new sidekick on this show right here, Luke. Oh, there we go. Right, you got it? <laughs> how, how you doing? We got to... <laughs> just, just, just make sure it counts, guys. <laughs> uh, but now you're... You're going to ca- be a judge on the show. No, that that I like doing. That, that uh-huh. is, That's a definite, definite plus. I definitely do that. Mm. Uh, you're, and now you're casting for the show right now, right? We are, yeah. We went down in the breakdowns and we're... We've had a lot of people. We've had over 100 submissions from new, newscasters already. And, uh, you know, anywhere from, like, seasoned journalists to people that, you know, took two weeks in a hosting class. I had one guy that came in and he goes, well, I'm better than Ryan Seacrest. And I'm like, why are you better? He goes, well, my eyes are more captivating. I said, please look at the camera and say that because I think you might get the gig. <laughs> <laughs> There's going to be people like that on there. Well, that, that's confidence. But, <laughs> exactly. Bring it. Yeah, and, and, and talking about Ryan Seacrest, you know, did, uh, did you hear My that? idol. Yeah, your idol. You're, 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 you're American idol. Uh, no pun exactly. intended. No pun intended. Um, exactly. But, uh, you know, look, th- this guy, you know, look, you, nobody can take it from him. He was at the right place at the right time, and he became big, and he took every opportunity along the way. He's a hard worker, no doubt. You know, but now. He's doing his thing. You know? Yeah, he's doing his thing. You know, I. He's got 97 jobs, you know. I know. Remember in Living Color when you had the Jamaican that had that nine jobs? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> I, had I, nine night jobs. Nine night jobs, and he had eight day ones. So, <laughs> you know. But yeah. You ever he, see the movie? You ever see the movie Vacation? Uh oh uh, yeah yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when he goes, Ed's going to let me quit one of my night jobs, and the baby comes, the <laughs> pregnant lady that was smoking and ironing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah right. Smoking and ironing, she's, she's pregnant and everything. That's funny. <laughs> It's yeah. funny. It's funny. You know, but uh, yeah, you know, you um, yeah, you've come up with uh, a, a lot of things in uh, in entertainment where a lot a lot of people they 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 get they go to Hollywood with uh, delusions of grandeur and they don't go in with a plan. And basically, what what you're doing here, what you've been doing, is creating. I'm gonna say you're creating the foundation for an empire. Okay. Well, thank you, brother. An entertainment empire where you're going to be able to, 
you know, cross over from TV, film, music, comedy, whatever, you know, even, even, I mean, shoot, I mean, I, I can even see you probably doing something on Broadway. Shit. I mean, if Mike Tyson is doing it, why not you? The Mike and CBD show. Yeah, there you it's go. It's ludicrous. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> More like lions. Yeah. <laughs> that, 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 would, that would be interesting, without a doubt. We have to get Spike Lee behind that one. Um, but... But yeah, you know, you uh, you paid your dues, though, man. Seriously, you you paid your dues, and see, you, the, the 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 phones don't stop with you. Phones are ringing around oh, here, brother. Oh, I know who's that. My, who's my secretary? Yeah, you got it. What, what's your secretary? She's two, right? How old's your daughter? She's in his office. Yeah. Um, sorry, I can't find the phone, brother. Okay. Um, but um, but yeah, you know, growing up, I always saw people like Dick Clark, and then I learned more about, you know, Dick Clark and. He didn't. He wasn't just in front of the camera. He created content. He, he had a production company. Right. You know, he created the American Music Awards, and you know, being a little bit of a control freak like you know Ryan Seacrest, and mm -hmm. you know, I just wanted to be in control of my own destiny. So, you know, telling jokes is great to be on stage, but you know, it's a lot of work and sometimes not too much payoff. Right. So I, I didn't want to sit around and wait for the phone to ring or go on auditions, and so I, you know, after Mark started the comedy came out and my vision came to fruition, I'm like. Okay, let's let's try another project. Let's try another project. And now I'm working with people like you know Troy Ladd, the Hot Rod Builder of the Year from Hollywood Hot Rods, and got a project going with him. And I saw that you're involved in um, uh, Christopher Reeve and, and Dana Reeve Foundation. You've done some stuff along those lines, and yes. you're supportive of that foundation. Where you know we're taking uh, you know I want to do stuff that's inspirational too. And like I took Troy, who's like this rockabilly, cool hot rod dude, and he wanted to do something good. He wanted to give back instead of just building a hot rod for millionaires. You know, he's got $300,000 hot rods in his shop, but we wanted to do something inspirational and, and a way for him to give back. So we created, um, it's called hot rod heroes where there's unsung heroes say like, you know, and the, the pilot episode, the first episode is actually my cousin who became paralyzed and in an auto accident. And he was going to be the first person in my family to ever go to college on a scholarship and all this stuff. Well, we didn't know if he was going to live, and my uncle was in the hospital and said, "Hey, you know, get out of that, get out of this bed, and I'll give you the keys to your dream car, the '68 Camaro." Well, that was 18 years ago, and he still hasn't been able to walk. He's paralyzed, and the, the, no one's ever driven the car. The car's still sitting in the barn. Wow. So we're going to take the car and make that hot rod handicap accessible, nice, and give it to give it to him. Nice. So it could be a situation like that, or a situation where. Say a, a man is a widower now because his wife died of cancer, and you know he has a family to support, or three daughters, and had to sell like his project Mustang in the, in the garage to get a minivan. Well, the whole community chips in, kind of like Extreme Home Makeover, or Makeover, what that show is called, and you know surprises this guy with a dream car. But it, you know it could be a veteran, something like that, where it's like an unsung hero that deserves the Hot Rod Builder of the Year, this famous guy, mm -hmm. to give him his dream car. Oh, I like that. Thank you, buddy. I like that deal because you're you're doing good. You know, you're you're definitely a good brother, man. You know, you're doing your thing, and uh, uh, wow, you know, um, that that's that that's a story, you know, and stories like that is what inspires people, you know, to uh, I mean, for, for a car to sit in a barn for what eighteen years, then yeah, no one, nobody's touched it. No. You know, it went from being a decent hot rod to now it's you know. It needs the engine pulled. It needs everything done, paint. So we contact people in the community. We paint. We contact the paint shop. Mm -hmm. Say, hey, we're doing this. And, and people are aware of the story. And most of these small communities, people are aware of the unsung heroes, the dad that comes home and doesn't make a big deal about, you know, he had his dream car for 20 years in the garage. That, you know, but something happened in life, you know, with the economy, whatever it is, mm -hmm. he had to give up his own dreams and, and you know, to pro provide for his family. Or it could be a, a veteran, a disabled veteran that came back. Mm -hmm. Whatever the case is, you know, we want to do something good and, and give back and surprise them, you know, here with this famous hot rod guy that, you know, got this cool image and everything, but to show that, you know, people also want to do some good. Yeah, but that's good stuff, man. That's definitely good stuff because, you know, a lot of times people forget. They, they forget about, you know, whether it be the heroes or the person that lost their ability to walk or whatever the case may be because life goes on. And, exactly. And you're going back and you're saying, okay, you've been through this. Let's do this, but let's surprise you. Exactly. 
you know, show you that people are thinking about you, and, and yeah. you deserved it. Yeah, and, and you're, you're providing the entertainment factor. You're you're doing you're you're definitely you know providing them with a better quality of life because you do something like that for someone. I mean that that that's a life tile for them, and that's something they'll never forget. And for them to have uh, again going back to the uh, handicapped or uh, situation, uh, someone to have a uh, a handicap accessible vehicle and improves the quality of their lives too. And how cool to have a '68 Super Sport Camaro handicap, you that, know, hot rod. That's sick. That's sick. <laughs> With Tiptronic, uh, you know, transmission. Yeah, well, j- just imagine him zooming by and he pulls over and he comes out of his wheelchair. It's like, damn. <laughs> pimp, pimp my wheelchair. Yeah, exactly. Pimp my wheelchair. Oh, man. We'll, get, we'll have to get what's his face on the show then. <laughs> Tim Allen. That's another. That's a spinoff show we're going to do. Yes, it's a spinoff show, no doubt. You know, let, let me ask you a question, Stevie, just to, to get back right, to buddy. something serious. Now, when you were diagnosed with cancer, you know, and, mm-hmm. and again, I'm going to pick your brain a little bit, you know, and, and it may get emotional for you. I don't know. But what what were the first thoughts that came to your mind? The very first thought, well, first of all, is like I couldn't believe it because, you know, I try to be healthy. My dad actually died at 40. So that's always been in the back of my mind. And for over 20 years, you know, I've gotten, I got certified years ago and uh, different certi- types of certifications. And, I've, you know, I've always, you know, tried to take care of myself and, not only that Hollywood's a competitive town, but always I had that in the back of my mind, like, hey, my dad went, you know, without much warning, some massive heart attack uh, at 40. So I'm like, oh, shit, you know, I don't know what's in the cards for me or if I got just messed up, you know, genes, but, you know, I got to do everything I can. And I've always tried to live life with gusto. I wake up every day and try to get out of the day and kick ass and, you know, take care of business. So when I came out of left field, I'm like, is this a mistake? Uh, and, but, you know, cause the odds were very low. And the first thing they asked was, you know, is this in your, is this in your family? Is there a history of this? And uh, there wasn't. So the more research I did, I found out it's only 10% history. So it's just luck of the draw. They said it could be something in the air. So I told the doctor, somebody better get Aaron Brockovich on the phone because, you know, somewhere along the line, something, you know, whether it's environmental, whether it's something I ate, some pesticides, you know, I don't know. And I've done a lot of research since then. But the first thing that, that hit me that night was, oh, shit, I've got two babies at home. Right. And here I'd always, you know, I've been out here for a long time, hustling and comedy and sacrificing a lot. You know, I'm 2,600 miles away from my family in Kentucky. I moved out here on my own to, you know, because it was my dream. Mm-hmm. And so now for this, you know, to be hit like, you know, with a brick bat saying, okay, you know, it was a wake-up call. So, you know, I thought I enjoyed life and got the most out of every day before, but now I really try not to waste a minute because, you know, no matter what you have in life, there's no guarantee you're going to have tomorrow. No. So, you know, the first thing I thought was I would just want to be here for my for my kids. I want to, you know, want to see them grow up. I want to be a good example. You know, you know, my parents divorced when I was, you know, three years old or whatever. So, you know, my dad was, you know, a hellraiser. So I always said, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to do it right. And so that's been my biggest concern is just to be here. So the, the first year I got my four checkups and the year anniversary was my deadline for my book. I printed the first draft at 1157 on St. Patrick's night. That was my deadline. Midnight was my deadline. And, uh, you know, I'll have two checkups a year for the next five years, blood test, and hopefully it's all good. All right, it's all but the main thing good. is, you know, oh, thank you. And, yeah. and I, you know, I'm healthy and I'm going to stay healthy and, but, you know, watch what you're putting in your body mm-hmm. and, uh, you know, as you know, and, uh, and get checked, you know. The, the pamphlets, my, my doctor, when he diagnosed me that afternoon, I remember it was like 4.56, I'm driving home in Hollywood, you know, life is good, I get the call, and just like he's telling me, like, you know, my, my car's ready, you put in a new carburetor, you know, like it's no big, he calls, yeah, you got cancer, call the office tomorrow, I'm going out of town for three weeks, but, uh, you know, I'll see you when I get back. And I'm like, should I go to work tomorrow? Am I dying? Hmm. He's like, yeah, go to work. I'll talk to you in three weeks. I go, three, three weeks. So I went to the lab the next day, and uh, I'm giving you a lot of stuff in the book, by the way, for free here, buddy. <laughs> but uh, no, I'm kidding. I, I, uh, no, but, but I pe- went. People, people read it, man. This is, this is, this well, is, thank you. This yeah. is the good stuff, man. This is definitely the good stuff. Well, thank you. So I went, you know, I went, and, and at first I was embarrassed. I'm going to the urology department for prostate cancer. I'm like, there must be some mistake. I'm standing in, in line, and the lady can't find my folder, and she's like, 
you know, Dupin, Stephen Dupin, uh, prostate cancer, can't find his folder. And I'm like, shh, 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 you know, you can, I'll come back later. No. And I get, I get the lab results and there's like Gleason scores and other stuff. It's, you know, and I barely got out of high school. I don't know what any of this stuff means. And I come home in the pamphlet. First of all, there's a guy that's got, you know, like a walker on the cover that's like 112 years old. And I open it. The first thing I see is life expectancy, five years. And it, I'm like, almost had a heart attack, you know, forget the cancer, almost died from a stroke right then. Yeah, and meanwhile, and the, the doctor is away for three weeks. The doctor's playing golf in Cancun for three weeks. Yeah, he's gone. And uh, that so bastard. I'm freaking out because <laughs> I didn't know the doctor. I had just, just been assigned this urologist. I'd never been to a urologist before. So, you know, it wasn't like I had his home number or anything. So, I'm, you know, I'm freaking out. So the first thing I see was life expectancy, five years. And the line right after that said average age, 72. So, they so I'm like, well, obviously this, this doesn't apply to me. So I closed the pamphlet. I said, I'm not reading one more thing in this until I do my own research. So I networked and through the people that I know, and, you know, they got me to some big doctors that wouldn't take my call, you know. Uh, but they got me to the biggest doctor, this Dr. David Agus, who just had a big book come out this past year. that was a New York Times bestseller. He told me to get to these two doctors. Mm-hmm. So I, it was this crazy story. I went to like, I went to like, I think eight different Kaiser hospitals. I was with Kaiser trying to track these guys down. They, you know, I'd get to one hospital. They had gone to another hospital. This one guy wouldn't call me back. I found out the other guy had retired. So I was down to one because he said, you got to do, I talked to pathologist. He said, you have to do robotics. It's a, you know, it, it's a robot. It's the guy, the surgeon is putting his hands in gloves. Everything is magnified, so it's more nerve-sparing, which is what I wanted. Mm-hmm. You know, I wanted the plumbing to work after the surgery. Right. And uh, so he said, go robotics. So there's only two places in Southern California that do this operation, and it's very expensive. So I couldn't get – one guy had retired. I couldn't get to the other guy. I found another guy, and they have to accept you for the, for the procedure, for the operation. They, you have to be accepted. So I took a picture of my, our family Christmas picture with my two babies and my wife, and I said, look, dude. This is my family. I have two little ones at home. I got to be around for a long time. Let's do this. So, you know, he accepted me, and which was cool. But then I get a call from the other guy that David Agus had recommended. The mm-hmm. big top surgeon said, get to this guy. Mm-hmm. So then I said, oh, this could be bad karma. I've got this surgeon that seemed very confident that, you know, I trusted that agreed to do it. Mm-hmm. But the guy that I was trying to get to had now said, okay, I'll see you. I went to see him. He said, I can do it too. I'll, I'll, I'll take you on. So I tried to get back to Dr. David Agus, and I said, look, man. And I called my friend Ken Jung. I don't know if you've, you've seen The Hangover or you watch, I think it's Community, that, that the little Asian guy oh, in The Hangover yeah. that jumped out of the trunk naked. Yeah. That's a buddy of mine, <laughs> Ken Jung. So Ken Jung used to be a comedian. Right. He's a really good friend of mine. So he, and he was a comedian, but he, he was also a doctor. He was a real doctor. So I called Ken, and I said, Ken, you're not going to believe this, dude. I got, I got prostate cancer. He's like, what? So I said, here's, here's my situation. I said, I've, Dr. David Agus told me to get to this guy. He wouldn't return my call. I couldn't get to him. I found this other surgeon. I told him who he was. And I said, this other guy agreed to do it. But now the other guy has, has also agreed to do it. What should I do? And he said, go with your instincts. He said his wife had breast cancer. Mm-hmm. A good friend of his that was a surgeon was supposed to do it. But when it got down to it, just something told him not to go with him. Even though it was a friend, he goes, F feelings. F other people's feelings is about you and your family. And so I asked Dr. David Agus, and he said, I can't, you know, morally I can't uh, answer that. It's unprofessional for me to advise who you should go with. Mm-hmm. So we said, we presented it like, if it was your son, who would you choose? And he said, Dr. Williams, and that's who I went with, the other guy. Okay. So I said, okay, it's on. And, uh, yeah, we did the deal, and uh, it was all good. Yeah, Stevie, you know, I I hate to interrupt you right now, but we have to take a quick break, and we're going to be back uh, to talk about what's going going on with you uh, with with cancer, with the cancer that you battled and and everything else. All right, so, um, so we'll be back on the UCW radio show with our special guest, Stevie D. Hey. You want to see something cool? Check this out. My name's Anitra, and I'm going to rock your world. Wow. Wow. Oh, my God. Look at that. Wow. 
Oh my god! Along with my boys Mikey and Joey. I need the Shalaba brothers stack! We're knocking down walls and taking names. The brothers actually get something done. And everyone gets to play. Progress is slow. We should be finished by Christmas. Girls with power tools, roll. We're not just bringing back the den, baby. We're making mega dens that'll blow you oh, away. Oh, wow! What are you doing? Oh, Anitra, it's unbelievable. <laughs> that is cool. You want some of this? Facial recognition, motion activity. This They're going to wet their pants. This may be the coolest room I have ever seen. Because life is too short to live without a mega den. to the UCW radio show. Um, we were just listening to the theme song of Rockstar is a Comedy. You can check that out on rockstarsacomedy.com. Uh, that's uh, Stevie D's uh, deal. And we have our special guest, Stevie D, on the uh, the show. Uh, and where we left off, we were talking about uh, decisions where he decided on uh, going a certain route with a doctor. And, uh, you know, basically all the, all the tough decisions that uh that you had to make stevie you know you, it, it wasn't an easy deal all around there were a lot of tough really tough decisions that you had to make yeah like i said i had meetings set up you know during that whole month of my surgery so i didn't tell anybody why but i was telling the production companies and the networks hey i'm going to be out you know out of pocket here for about three weeks and then when i i came back i, I still didn't tell anybody why and then you know Slowly, I started, you know, once once I got back on my feet, got the rocking and rolling again, and 
like, as I told you with an ego going to the gym and being a gym rat yeah. and hitting the gym and I'd lost weight. And then I was telling you the other day, you see these young punks in there slinging weights. And so your ego says, you know, show them how it's done. But meanwhile, I'm lifting seven pounds over here. Right. I said, I wanted to get a t-shirt that said, I'm not a wussy, you know, I'll, I'll clean it up, but I'm not a wussy. I just had cancer, <laughs> but you know, everything healed and, uh, you know, we're back in action and, so, you know, I don't know if you've had this kind of conversation on your show before, so sorry if I brought down the energy, but, no, uh, no, no, you know, but we, can talk, you know, we can talk about strippers in the old days. Yeah. We can still talk about that. Yeah, we're, gonna, <laughs> we're definitely going to talk about that, Steve. Uh, you know, uh, but, uh, just, yeah, but you know the thing is, man, seriously, you know, that what what you're talking about right now is real stuff. Everything else is background noise. We talked about that. All the stuff we exactly. do is background noise because you lose your health. You know what? It doesn't matter because it doesn't matter. It really doesn't. Okay? Mm-hmm. You it know, doesn't I, matter. Yeah, I mean, I had, look, I had Brett Hudson on on the show, and we, and he, it was about his, his career, but also about him battling cancer. Okay? Exactly. Uh, and I, I think, How's he doing, by the way? Uh, I, last, I, last I spoke to him, he was, uh, he was moving along, but I haven't, I haven't spoken to him in a little bit, so uh, hopefully he's doing well. Um, but also, I also mentioned to you that uh, we, we had uh, Amy Weber, the uh, former WWE diva, on the show, uh-huh. and she also had a uh, battle with cancer. So this is all real stuff, and I and, and our listeners, you know, they they connect on a human level, and also, you know, they connect on on, on a high on a high level with your with your entertainment, what's going on. But it's about real stuff, man. So don't don't think you're you're being a downer. You're not. You know, this is the stuff that we want to talk about. Well, cool, buddy. And then this is the first interview I've done on this subject. And uh, like I said, I kept it kind of low-key while I was writing the book because uh, I was told not to talk about your writing the book until you have a book, until the book is done. Because, you know, you can talk about stuff all day long. Yeah. But, you know, until you put your words into, into, into action and uh, be a doer, you know. Um, but, yeah, I felt good. And, and what's weird, like 24 hours after you're diagnosed, you're driving around LA and you're looking at people that, you know, are taking care of themselves. They're eating junk food that are, you know, and you just don't know what, what life's going to, you know, what hand you're going to get. So, you know, take advantage of every day. No, and you have to, and that's what you're doing. And, and now, you know, that you're, you're healthy and I know you're still going through your, your, um, I guess your timeline, with uh you know you i guess you want to go through through a certain point so you can have a big celebration hey you made it past this mark you know but i think you have a lot of people out there that are pulling for you and praying for you and everything for for your uh your your continued recovery from um from this cancer that uh, you were dealing with well thank you buddy yeah the one year mark is a big big mark and uh you know so we're all clear and uh look out ryan seacrest yeah. Putting you out of business, buddy. Yeah, well, that, that's your thing. You're like you're in Hollywood. You're styling and profiling. You're doing your thing. You're creating the mayhem that a lot of that's people, right. a lot of people, are afraid to do. Man, you you're not worried about you know insulting someone. You're not worried. I mean, you're not that you're doing anything bad, but you're not worrying about hurting someone's feelings. You're worried about bringing the best to the table, whether it be the stage, the the TV, or the screen. You're looking to bring it. On, on all levels, 100% of the time, and you're looking to bring a lot of great people uh, to the table with you. Thank you, man. I'm just trying to align myself with huge people like your Rich Franklins and like your Tommy Lee's and just ride their coattails, you know? Yeah, well, hey. Make a check table to CVD. <laughs> yeah. At Make least... a check table to CVD. There you go, as long as you're honest about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so... I'll give you a kickback and... Uh... It'd be a package deal. Yeah, there you go. You got no, I'm just trying to create, I try to use the same energy I used to put into, you know, going out and doing a comedy gig. And, you know, a lot of people think you, comics get on stage and just up there BSing. And when you have, you know, FU money or BS money, you can take more liberties. But it's competitive in this town and in the bigger cities where the, the, the artists go, whether it be a band or an actor or a comic, mm-hmm. there's thousands of people that want your spot. Sure. So the people that are getting those spots are few and far between. So you got to bring it. You got to bring your A game every time. So you know, while I was down and while I was recovering, and you know, when I had had my little ones come along, I'm like, you know, it's, it's more about than just getting on a, a stage and making some people laugh. Mm-hmm. Let's create some. Let's create our destiny here. Let's create an empire and 
create some good good content and some good vehicles and mm-hmm. align ourselves with positive people. Yeah. You know, I haven't worked with anybody so far. You know, nobody that really taken to the networks or created something for it that I didn't like as a person. Right. You know. And then that that's, so, that's key know, stuff that, that you have to you have to get get along with the person on a personal level because you do that then you guys can align and really fight the battle to make things happen. Exactly. And and uh you know you got to believe in the in the projects if you want it to have legs. Mm-hmm. And I've had people, you know a lot of people pitching me shows now and they're bringing me projects and they're like can you and if I don't have a connection, if I don't think it's my my style or my the type of brand that I want to create, and I don't think they're the type of person that you know is a good is a good dude, you know, that I have your back and and stands for the same the same principles that, that I do and the same standards, then I'm not going to work with them. Yeah, right. that's, I think that's why there's something lost in translation. People look at Hollywood or they they want to get and have a reality show, whatever they want to do, and they think it's as easy as throwing something. Uh, a sizzle reel or something in front of someone and hoping that it's going to, you know, tickle their fancy. But, this, this, yeah. I mean, as you, as you said, there has to be a connection on, on another, another level. you got to like the person because it's not just about exactly. business, you know, because you're building a relationship. That's exactly right, you know. Ryan Seacrest went out and found some, you know, Armenians with big butts in, in, uh, in huh. Calabasas. You know, I could do that, but... Uh, <laughs> it, but, he's got a lot more money than I do, but uh, you know I'll hold out until the right, the right thing is going to come along. Yeah, I mean, you know, the thing is, you talk about Dick Clark, and there was news not too long ago. I think about like three, four days ago, that Ryan Seacrest is actually looking to buy Dick Clark Productions. Mm-hmm. You know, so that's, pretty, that's crazy. Yeah, he wants uh, he wants all the jobs in Hollywood. Yeah. But you know he's doing his thing. He's a hustler. Yeah, and uh, you know I give it to him. Well, it's smart. It's smart because what he's doing, and he he understands. I guess learning from when he was uh, with, on American Idol in the beginning, when uh, what was it, Dunkelman, right? Mm-hmm. When they had uh, that first season, then after that. Dunkelman left. He stood, and there you go. That's that's how history's made, you know. But he, mm-hmm. under, I guess, he understood that content in this environment is king. So exactly, you you create the content. You know what? You're you're more powerful than someone just in the content. Yeah, you you can you know control your own destiny. Like you know, who can fire Ryan Seacrest now? Nobody. He's like, you're gonna fire me? I I just bought the show. Yeah, so yeah. fire me. <laughs> I'll fire you. <laughs> you By know? the way, Dunkelman and I had the same agent at the time, and he's still complaining about that. Yeah, well, he should. It, Jeez. <laughs> yeah, he's at a Holiday Inn bar right now somewhere. You know, telling the bartender. Yeah, I was on the first season of American Idol, <laughs> but that was that was that was his that was his choosing, though. You know, he made that choice. Yeah, I've heard you know both sides of the story. I don't know what's true, but I know that it wasn't a good, it was not a good business decision. Uh, nah, you, know, you think? <laughs> sometimes you got to be a sidekick and let someone else, you know, take the glory and go along for the ride and plan your next move. Yeah, I mean, you could be you can in, in in a team of Abbott and Costello. You can be Costello your whole career and and do very well. So uh, sometimes it's exactly. okay. Take the platform. Yeah, that's it. And it's about going to the bank and building a foundation. Mm-hmm. You know, and and you know, one person that comes to mind when I think about you because of what you're doing and how you're doing it, I think about Adam Sandler. Okay. Oh yeah? yeah, yeah, yeah. He's rocking it. No, he he's rocking it. But he was on SNL and he went off and he started doing movies and stuff. But he went and he didn't. He did things smart. He he knew who his friends were in comedy. Mm-hmm. He knew who mm-hmm. his friends were. He went and he, he created Happy Madison and he developed a foundation where he's able to bring his friends into the mix and open up doors for them, for them doing their own thing. And he's been doing that exactly. for a while. Yeah, if you look at, I mean, a lot of people, I don't know if they realize, a lot of these movies you see, you know, whether it's, you know, Seth Rogen Project or Judd Apatow or who it is, it's, it's, their, it's, their, it's a boys club. And, yeah. you know, they're bringing up people that they used to sleep on their couch with. Yeah. So if you see, you see The Hangovers in all these movies or, you know, a Happy Madison production, it's him and all of his buddies, which is great. You know, they're looking out for each other. He's, he's got his little, you know, he's got his friends with him, you know. I got a great compliment one day. I went to a fundraiser uh, about a year ago and talked to Kevin James, and he gave me props for Rockstar's a comedy. I'm like, well, shit, that's a good, 
that's that's a pretty good compliment right there coming from Kevin James and say I did a good job with rock stars. And it was my first project. I definitely didn't know what the hell I was doing, but I had a vision and I believed in it. Mm-hmm. And that's what that's all you need. You need the vision. You need to not be afraid to live your dreams. Exactly. Okay. And, Just like you do with your show here, brother. Yeah. And, uh, we appreciate you bringing other people up and, you know, giving props to other people and you're, you're doing good stuff. Well, I mean, look, I think we're all trying to, uh, we're all trying to reach the same place, different avenues, getting to the same place, and just paying it forward, man. That's all you can do in life. You build up, get yourself to a high level, and bring people up with you. Because you have a lot of people that don't do that, Stevie. You have a lot of people that don't do that. Yeah, I mean, you'd be, you know, I've worked with a lot of people who are now blowing up, and you know, phone doesn't ring, and uh, you know, which, which is all good, which is which is good, and looking out for number one, but, you know, you got to believe in yourself and don't forget where you came from and try not to burn bridges along the way because they'll come back to bite you in the ass. Yeah, well, that's why, again, and like, and like an Adam Sandler, he will always do what he does. You will always uh-huh. do what you do, and that's what makes you different in, in Hollywood. I had, uh, I had Dexter Tucker on the show uh, yesterday, okay, and again, he's doing that as well. He's, he's, not, writing, uh, he's not writing his brother uh, Chris Tucker's uh, coattails. He's doing his own thing, but he's doing something uh-huh. along the lines of creating a foundation and giving opportunity to his friends in comedy and opening up those doors so i mean i commend you for doing that man and i think that this i think 2012 going into 2013 you're gonna you're gonna create such a buzz such a a whirlwind of of stuff that's gonna happen it's gonna be amazing well cool buddy thank you from uh you know yeah and i'm diving in for that i'm diving yeah Yeah, i'm I'm diving in jump on the party train there you go (laughs) (laughs) I got to get on, got to get on that train, you know, and get on the rock train. Yeah, there you go. Now, now Stevie, you know, we, you mentioned earlier that when you first got, uh, we, you you lived in Kentucky as a kid, right? Mm-hmm. Okay, that's right. And you got up and you just went to L.A. on your own, probably not with a dime in your pocket to chase a dream. I had one suitcase and a, and a picture of the king. Uh, I had a picture of Elvis Presley with me, man, and, and we jumped on the. <laughs> I went down to Panama City first, and uh, actually what happened is I'd never been outside of Kentucky growing up. We didn't have a car. We were on food stamps. And I was in high school, and I got the opportunity to go down to Panama City, you know, that they call the Redneck Riviera. (laughs) And I I hit the beach, and I was like, it was like I was on another planet, man. And I looked at this nightclub that was on the beach, and I said, I just had a a vision. I said, you know what? You know, college is overrated. I'm going to get out of school. I'm going to get out of high school. I'm going to come here, and I'm going to I'm going to DJ in that nightclub right there. But at the time, I was 17. I'd never been a DJ before. Right. And two weeks after I graduated from high school, I moved to Panama City Beach. And within a year and a half, I was a DJ at that nightclub. It was called Spinnaker. And uh, so from there, I said, okay, check phase one. Now I'm going to go a little bit further. Let's let's head west. Let's go where, the, where television shows are made. And I jumped on the 10, and I was... I was in Panama City and I uh, had the dream gig there, hosted all the spring break contests, and, you know, it was, it was a cush job, but, you know, I'd been there, and I, and I like to always challenge myself and, and quit and jumped in my car and, and drove out here. And uh, I'm still here and uh, kind of did the same thing. I went on the Sunset Strip. I saw the Laugh Factory. There's a big marquee on the Laugh Factory. And like I said, there's thousands of comics, you know, all, you know, tooth and nail trying to get stage time in this, in this town, and I thought, okay, a, a mark, a goal for me is to get my name on that marquee. And they only put up three or four names a week, and there's only a handful of people that are regulars. Mm-hmm. So that was a goal that I had, and, and, you know, I did that. And, you know, once I did that, then on to the next, on to the next episode. And uh, now just, I can just put Ryan Seacrest out of business, mission accomplished, and, you know. Go back and uh, live on the compound in Kentucky. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you know, make some moonshine and uh, you know sleep with my cousins like the good old days. <laughs> well, don't, don't tell your <laughs> wife that. <laughs> so we're related. I didn't. I didn't tell you that. <laughs> oh, okay. My second cousin on my mom's side. <laughs> Yeehaw! You because the Hatfield, not the McCoy. There you go. As long as, long as you're not having any wars in the house, you're doing all right. <laughs> no, actually, her father is a judge, which is another um, you know chapter in the book. Oh, that's good. They get you out of trouble. <laughs> Not exactly what he had in mind when he was paying for those private Catholic schools for a redneck hillbilly to drive up in a Trans Am and park on his lawn and jump out of the T-tops. 
Oh, well, when you let's, know, let's party, Your Honor. <laughs> yeah, Can I get right. one of those get out of jail free cards, bro? Yeah, <laughs> you you need that 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 <laughs> card in your wallet all the time, just in case, because you never know. You never know. Especially... I tried to be a gentleman and bring him a six pack of Bud, but I drank three of them on the way there, so that wasn't too cool. <laughs> no, I'm sure he didn't like that, especially when he when he grabbed the empty can. That probably that probably wasn't cool. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, he was like, you know. Republican and conservative, and he said, hey, Stevie, who do you vote for? And I was like, vote? Don't you have to register for that? I'm, I think I still have warrants in Kentucky. I don't <laughs> think that's a good idea, bro. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know what? That's funny. That is funny. But, but you know, look, man, you know, your your story is amazing, you know, and I, that's why I wanted to do the rewind over here and talk about your, your journey from Kentucky to L.A., you know, because a lot of times people aren't going to hear this. They're going to – they'll see what they see in front of them now. They'll see Stevie D. They'll see rock stars of comedy. They'll see what you have going on with Tommy Lee and Rich Franklin and uh, Troy Ladd uh, and so on and so forth. They, that's what they're going to see. But I want pe- I wanted people to see the real you, uncovered, naked. Well, not, not, not oh, really again? naked. It's, oh. not, it's not that type of show. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you saw those pictures when I first came to Hollywood, huh? Well, yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> I had to eat. Well, you have to put some. No, I just think if you believe in yourself, and you know, if you you, but don't. I read something the other day that was something to the effect. I don't remember exactly, but you know, don't let your goals outweigh your ability to work or something to that effect. I'll I'll send you the quote when I find it. But it was saying, be careful what you wish for, because you know, if you just keep pushing and you believe in yourself and you're willing to, you know, uh, preparation meets opportunity equals success. You you got to be ready for that opportunity, you know, mm-hmm. and. So if you're willing to put in the time and roll your sleeves up and and you see your vision, don't let anybody tell you, you know, differently. And that's the way you live your life. Yeah. I mean, you you can sit around waiting for something to happen or you can, you know, get your ass up and, you know, and and rock and roll and make it happen. No, I mean, uh, people should listen to your words because it's easy to sit back and do nothing. It's a little harder to do stuff, but the rewards are there if you want it. Yeah, and, you know, I don't know if my words are that inspirational. I'll still I'll quote from somebody better than, you know, more articulate than me. But, you know, if you can just believe in yourself and, and be a good person and, you know, and keep keep working, you know, have perseverance. Yeah, but, I mean, your words, of course, are going to carry weight because you're not you're not just speaking out of the side of your mouth. You know, you've been to the mountain top. You dealt with all the battles. I mean, battles that most people wouldn't ha- wouldn't be able to deal with. You dealt with it. All right. You have a beautiful family, beautiful kids, and you're you're right now on the cusp of some massive things happening. So why shouldn't they listen to you? You know, of course they should listen to you because you've been there. You know what you're talking about. So I'm listening to you. Well, thank you, brother. You know, Drink the Kool Aid. Drink the moonshine. They, they, well, you got you to send me some of that moonshine. Yeehaw! We have to get the general. We, we have to fire up that General Lee and get it going. <laughs> Troy Ladd needs to make me a General Lee, doesn't he? Yeah, I think so. I think so. I think he needs to hook that up. You know, now Stevie, uh, what, what's what's the uh, what's your website for Rockstars of Comedy? It's rockstarsofcomedy dot com. I took your advice, as you know. The last few years, I've been you know, more of, as a producer and then uh, a year, you know, taking care of the, the cancer stuff and, mm-hmm. and creating and produ- producing these, these projects. So I took your advice and started a Twitter a couple of days ago. Oh, there you go. So, yeah, I got I to gotta get rocking on that, man. So that's uh, at Stevie D Rocks. Okay, so people have to follow you at Stevie D Rocks because... That's right, man. I put little gems on there every day, my little, you know, hillbilly humor, uh, my take on what's going on in Hollywood and, you know, shenanigans. No, there you go. And, you know, the thing is, is that in, in Hollywood, you have a lot of people that come and go. You're one of the mainstays. And, you know, yeah, Ryan Seacrest, he has his deal. He's done his thing. Uh, and I mentioned Adam Sandler. He's done his thing. And you're doing your thing. And you're going to create these opportunities for the people around you. That's, I mean, why else would a Tommy Lee or Rich Franklin, you know, stand by your side? If they didn't think that well, you had... Know. If they didn't think that you were doing something, uh, you know, that was that positive. Well, my, thank you. My mother-in-law said the other day I had a, a charming way or a way of persuasion. I said, no, I think it's called the, the gift of BS. Huh. You know? <laughs> no. And a teacher told me that in school once. She's like, Steve, I think you're going to be a politician or something like that because you have a way of, you know, 
commanding attention. I'm like, well, you know, I don't know. Just like I enjoy being at the forefront. I like being a good example and, you know, I like to entertain people and don't take life too seriously, you know, take care, of, take care of your health, take care of your family and, and enjoy the ride. Well, I mean, you also have uh, a real a realism about you. You're not, you're not cloaking yourself. in, as you said, you know, you're talking about, you know, being a uh, BSing and stuff. You know, the reality is, anyone that's around you wouldn't be around you if you didn't you didn't uh, resonate with uh, positive energy and 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 a truth and a, and a truth about you. And that that's what it is. You, there's a truth about you that I feel that other people have said that they feel about you because you're not sitting there blowing smoke up their up their ass to get something done. Uh, you're actually bringing reality. That's why these people are also your friends. Well, thank you, man. You know, thank you, Lou. You, you got it, brother. You know it was great having you on the show, man. And we we ha- we're gonna have you on again and get some updates on rock stars of comedy and updates on on the reality show. And oh, on, on the reality show, um, how can people, you know, uh, get get involved in the casting? I know you you've had a lot of people cast for it already, uh, but how can they go about uh, submitting their 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 casting video? Yeah, it, it actually went out in the breakdowns, like I said, but we're still getting submissions. We haven't made the selection yet. Um, I think I sent you a link uh, on Actors Access. I, I guess I could tweet that, or I could put it on Facebook, or uh, even on Rockstar's The Comedy website, so people can submit, uh, you know, just do it. What, we haven't, what we're having submissions do, the people that want to submit, is, is just take any piece of... I, I can send you a little script that's just actually just news pieces that we took, we're giving people a, an option to either do a hard piece of news, mm-hmm. a serious piece of news, or just some fluffy entertainment stuff about, like, you know, any, whatever's going on in pop culture, entertainment, like Justin Bieber getting a fight with the paparazzi. You know, you know so I, I want to see personality. We want to see your take on it mm-hmm. um, so they can create their own little video on an iPhone or however you want to do it, make it look as pre- professional as you want, or it doesn't matter just as long as we see you and see your personality. Okay, now that, yeah. that's true. Uh, and, and and they would, now, would they be able, I guess, I mean, would they be able to put it on YouTube and submit it like that, or do they have to send you the file? They can send me a link to YouTube. We have accounts on Dropbox, and you send it in these other sites. But if they even just want to upload it themselves on their YouTube account, they can find me even on Facebook. It's by my government name there. It's Stevie Dupin, D-U-P-I-N, and send me a message on Facebook and give me a link and, uh, you know, we'll check it out and go from there. Well, I think we have to tweet this out and, uh, tweet it out, brother. Yeah, we got to tweet, tweet it out it. and get, and get, get some people out there. Cause I know there, there are a lot of people out there that would see this opportunity, you know, as wow, you know, I can actually go on a show and I have the dreams. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't have the money to go to a, uh, media school to learn how to be a reporter or a correspondent, but I'd like to give this a shot. Why not? Exactly. Yeah. I mean, you don't have to have a journalism degree. You, you know, you, you, we want to see personality. Can you report the news? And that's, that's basically all we need to see. It can be a two-minute little clip. Um, you know, if you look at Entertainment Tonight, if you're looking at E! or if you're looking at CNN thinking, I can do that, well, show us you can do it. No, anyway, I think that's awesome stuff. I'm sure you're going to get a lot of interesting submissions. <laughs> Yeah, we already have, man. I would, you know, I'll show you some of the outtakes. Yeah, definitely. We we got we got we got to check that out. All right, so we, we we're gonna tweet that out, and uh, you know, for all our listeners, you, know, you got to follow Stevie D uh, on Twitter, Stevie D Rocks. Uh, go to rockstarsofcomedy dot com. Check it out. Go on Facebook. Look them up. Uh, if you don't know how to get to them, you can always get in touch with me and look on Twitter or whatever, and you'll find links to it. You know, because this is uh, this is a guy, no doubt in my mind. You you're gonna want to keep an eye on not only today but in the future because he's gonna be a, another staple in Hollywood, but doing the right thing for up and comers and opening up those doors. You know, we've seen it time and time again with a lot of celebrities. I don't care if you're. Um, Again, uh, whether you're at Adam Sandler or even when Lucille Ball was around, she opened up doors for people. This is what this is what Stevie D is doing. So follow this guy because th- his future is is just brighter than ever. He's done he's done great things. He's going to do greater things. And Ryan Seacrest, watch out! Not sign out. Watch, watch out! out. <laughs> just, just like Lucille Ball, Vivian Vance just maintained that weight of twenty pounds heavier than Lucille, like it was in their contract. 
if Ryan will always stay four inches shorter than me, then I think he will, then we're going to be fine. We'll get along just fine. Oh, I think if he – well, you know what? I don't know. With his type of money, he may, he, he may have a, a Tom Cruise effect. I don't know. <laughs> He's got some lifts, you know, but uh, <laughs> yeah. it's all good. There's room for everybody, man. I'll go find me some big booty uh, Armenians uh, and, and, you know, have have, an, have the next Kardashians. I'll do a Russian version called the Kardushkis. Yeah, well, there, there you go. We, <laughs> we, get, we can get some, some, some Russians, maybe, maybe. <laughs> we we, we got to work on that. I think that's going to be the next thing. I don't know, Stevie. That's I don't it, know. brother. That's it. All right, brother. Look, thank and you. I'll, I'll tell Rich Franklin you want a piece of him when I talk to Rich. Yeah, let him know. But he's over there, which is good because I'm over here, so it all works out. But I have a feeling that that him and I are going to cross paths at one at one point or another. another but it's going to be on good terms. I promise. Good terms. He's I, a good dude. I, I, all right, I, I man. Promise. You're a good guy. Thank you for having me on. No, thank you, Steve. I appreciate it. We're going to have you back on soon. Thank you, brother. Okay. <laughs> what is your major malfunction? Well, let it be written. So let it be done. Ladies and gentlemen, my mother thanks you, my father thanks you, my sister thanks you, and I thank you.